to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me are my two fabulous co-hosts. I'm Jackie. I went before Diana today. Oh my goodness. Hi, everybody. Oh, sorry, who are you? I'm Diana. <laughs> Usually I go first, but today I went second. Well, it's so good to see you both, regardless of who went first in what order. Uh, so for those of you... Rob! <laughs> Jackie not, went first in front of I'm not, me! I'm not doing this again. Not doing it again. Just, <laughs> one take. One take. So for those of you new to the show, welcome. This is a show where we talk about behavior analytic research for eh, like an hour or so and say wonderfully intelligent things. So the articles that we will be discussing today are related to the topic of transitioning to adulthood. This is part two of our episode from last week. So if you have not listened to episode 13... Go back and listen to it because it does a lot of good summary of the challenges facing adults transition. Sorry, adolescents transitioning to adulthood that will give a little bit more context to our articles today. Now, on that same topic, today we'll be discussing two articles related to some skills that are needed for adolescents and young adults with autism, specifically talking about problems in the workplace and asking for help, and also looking at increasing employment options. So, our two articles are. Teaching Adolescents with Autism to Describe a Problem and Request Assistance During Simulated Vocational Tasks by Dotto Fogit, Reeve, Townsend, and Progar from the 2011 issue of Research in Autism Spectrum Disorders and an evaluation of two instruction methods to increase employment options for young adults with autism spectrum disorders by Burke, Anderson, Bowen, Howard, and Allen from the 2010 issue of Research in Developmental Disabilities. Let's start with teaching adolescents with autism to describe a problem and request assistance. And Diana, you are going to be talking about this very important issue for adults who are in the workplace. Because if you can't figure out how to ask for help, then you really are limited to the one or two vocational scripts you may have learned. I really like this article, and I think that it touches on a really important point, like you were mentioning, Rob. It's not just teaching one particular vocational task. It's teaching students how to ask for help with vocational tasks, and that was something that Dr. Gerhardt had discussed previously, is the importance of identifying these types of behavioral cusps for individuals transitioning to adulthood with autism and making sure they were teaching to those particular behaviors. So I really liked it for that reason. Uh, these were not yet adults that they did this study with. It was adolescents, like 12 and 13 year olds. So they were kids who were preparing to move into vocational work. And the tasks that they were doing were a relatively simple, whole bunch of different office type tasks, like stapling papers together and taking out the trash and filing things alphabetically. And that was less important for the study than identifying how to teach children to ask to go to their instructional aid, ask for help, and then further describe and identify what the problem was that they were having. So they taught four different individuals with autism how to do this, and that was really the base of the study. They had four boys in the study, ages 12 and 13. They were Jared, David, Gavin, and John. And what they were really looking at here were the number of vocational trials, which were all different activities that they had in place, the percentage of those trials in which the students learned to approach the instructor, describe the problem, and then request assistance with that particular problem. And like I said, the tasks were um, office-type tasks like erasing the board, clipping papers together, filing index cards, stuffing envelopes, and there were about 10 or 12 different tasks that they were looking at. I really liked the way that they had this particular study set up. The independent variable was a treatment package of initially providing prompting and scripts and then script fading. They used graduated guidance to have children go over to the adult, so physical prompting for that piece. And then they used scripts and script fading for the other two components, requesting assistance and then describing the problem at hand. And within each session, I really liked how they broke this down. So they used that type of instructional package and across 15 different trials every time that they ran it. They had three different types of problem scenarios that they were looking at. They were some piece of material was missing, something for the materials that they needed for the task was broken, or something was mismatched in size. So they needed to put the, the binder 
together with the papers, but the papers were too small to fit into the binder or something along those lines. So they had each of those types of problems, and for each type of problem, each of the three types of problems, they had different scenarios, right? So different materials were needed. So they had built in sort of multiple exemplars within each of the problem types. Three times three is nine, so that made up nine of the 15 trials. That's we, good. You're, you're good at that. I math. know. <laughs> Thank you. So that left six trials left, right? Did I get that right? Yep. Okay, <laughs> good. Of the remaining six, three were what they called typical trials. So in this type of trial, there was no problem present. Nothing was broken or missing or mismatched in size. So they included that in order to ensure that the participants were discriminating whether there was a problem that needed to be addressed or not. I love that, really, because a mm. lot right? of the times in, we'll like be like, I'm missing this, I'm missing my spoon, I'm missing my paper clip. And then even if they're holding their spoon, they'll like walk over and be like, yeah. I'm missing my spoon while holding their spoon. I love that about this article. Yeah, I thought they did a really nice job in their preparation mm-hmm. for this article. Well, I think it gets to the point of it's very easy to teach uh, an adolescent if you're doing this task, go ask someone for help. It's right. not as easy to say, there's a time you need to do yes. that and a time you don't. Sort of the, the equivalent of when you teach the laundry TA. It's, it's very easy to teach a laundry TA. What's not easy is to teach an adolescent or young adult, hey, look at that big pile of clothes in the corner. You need to go do your laundry TA right. rather than, I'm an adult. I'm telling you to do your laundry TA. If right. I don't say to do it, just, you know, just keep piling up the clothes, I guess. <laughs> Until you have nothing left. <laughs> I don't know. This typical adult life right there. <laughs> I don't encounter this problem. Uh, somebody that magically does your laundry every couple of days. I don't know who it could be. I don't know. I just I put the clothes in the pile in the corner, and then they disappear, and they come back folded, and I don't know. Uh, that doesn't happen at my house, so <laughs> I need a magic laundry fairy. I yeah. think I am that that fairy at my house. I mean, my, my dream is if we earn enough money from people purchasing CEs from us, uh, mm-hmm. I can just do Diana's laundry all day, all week long. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. It's my, it's my dream. That's and sweet. my laundry, too. Yep. That's sweet, yeah. And you know what? Hey, I'll, I'll have the time, right? Yeah, it's true. Because I'll continue to work because I'm an independent woman. <laughs> all the women yeah. independent. <laughs> Remember just throwing it back. We talked about Beyonce for like the first like five episodes on ABA Inside Track. We did. I you did. Little, I was a little bit obsessed with Beyonce at that point, so we just had to throw back to Destiny's Child. That's right. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Problem solved. So those three typical trials were included for discrimination purposes. And then finally, the remaining three of the 15 trials were probe scenarios. So these were, again, problem scenarios, but ones that they hadn't previously encountered with those types of materials. So every time they ran this sequence, they had the 15 different types of trials. And like I said, they were measuring percent of independence across all three of the behaviors that they were looking at in order to determine how well their treatment package was working. Like I said, I really loved the arrangement that they had here. So within the teaching sessions, they had built in opportunities for generalization with the probe trials, discrimination as well with the typical trials, and then in addition to the way that the treatment package was set up, they also had pre-post generalization opportunities where they were looking at whether they saw generalization to a different setting with the tasks that they had learned. And then they also had maintenance probe opportunities too. So they did a one-month follow-up with the participants as well. So one thing I really liked about this study was their point system. So instead of like jumping in during like the teaching session And being like, you did it! Or providing an edible. All they did was provide points on a counter. Yeah. And so at the end of the session, they were like, all right, here are the many points you have. Now you can trade them in for something. I think that's really awesome and less stigmatizing for actual vocational skills. Yeah. It was a pretty subtle way to provide reinforcement for them, which was nice. I love that. I would think probably pretty easily translatable over to an actual vocational setting, too. This was just a mock setting. Yeah. Which I didn't mention before. You did. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. And I think it. I think it's kind of fun. And the only thing I'd have to worry about, though, is I actually tried this once with one of my students at a actual real setting. Yep. And he just stared at my hand where the golf counter was, waiting oh. for me to provide the click. Oh. <laughs> and so he'd be like, I'm going to put the cups on the shelf, stare at Jackie's hands. <laughs> I'm going to do this, stare at Jackie's hands. So we just want to be wary of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it didn't look like this happened here, so that's nice. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure your behavior was probably under that control, too. <laughs> yeah. Right? Unfortunately. Every time he was staring at you, you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I had to, like, creepily do it in my pocket <laughs> so that so that he couldn't 
watch what I was doing. Um, I what I didn't mention is, and I'm going to go through the graph for everyone too, so we can you know see how results turned out. But in sure. baseline was just as you would expect it to be. They were presented with the problem scenarios, but it was before they had been trained to learn how to ask for help. But <laughs> In the, the way that they describe it, they say that if the student did come over and properly ask or present the problem, like the stapler is broken, then the instructor just gave some type of non-committal, neutral response, like, oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Which is, I think, really hilarious. Um, I do like that. I wish that I wanted to do that. I could do that. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Mm. What should I do about that? So moving over to looking at the results for this study, the short version is that everyone learned really well using this treatment package. We saw increasing across participants for all three components of the response and overall responding also maintained at follow-up. But breaking it down a little bit further, this was a, a multiple baseline design across participants, Gavin, John, Jared, and then David. In this graph, they were looking at Independent responding during the teaching sessions, during the probe sessions, which were with the within-trial novel opportunities, the discrimination sessions in which there was the typical no-problem presented trials. So that should be zero, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. That should be zero percentage of target skill because the target skill is asking for help. Yes. Mm-hmm. So okay. if they were showing the response in that condition, then they had overgeneralized the right. response. That was confusing to me. Yes. Initially, I was like, why is it zero? And I, like, got a little scared. Me too. Um, I was like, what, is, was what like, about these triangles? That makes sense. <laughs> so the triangles are open, and they just dust the bottom of the graph for most of the participants. Yes, yes. They dust the bottom of the graph. Mm-hmm. And Gently graze <laughs> along the x-axis. The sand <laughs> at the beach. And then finally, there is the pre-post test, which are open squares. All participants, we saw behavior improve in initially the training condition and then also in the probe condition, although for some participants that took some additional training, Gavin was uh, primarily the one in which they needed to go back and provide some additional training for him for the probe sessions because he wasn't demonstrating it with the novel uh, material. So they did some more scripts. They had the scripts back in and then faded them out for seven sessions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm Mm-hmm. For John, they saw an immediate increase in responding across both the training trials and the probe trials. He initially had some level of difficulty with the discrimination in the typical trials, but eventually he stopped responding in that condition, which is what you wanted to see. For Jared, responding in the training trials immediately increased to high levels. Responding in the probe condition was somewhat variable, but eventually rose to higher rates. And then for David, we saw... uh, more incremental increase, I would say, for both the training and the probe trials initially, and then eventually responding increased to 100%. At the one-month follow-up, and they had all participants available at the one-month follow-up. Crazy. Which is great. That's impressive. Yeah. I feel like that Good hardly job, ever everyone. happens. I know. this was, I really liked, again, I really liked the design of the study. Um, so all participants showed some pretty nice responding at the one-month follow-up, with one participant having slightly lower responding in one condition, um, but overall, yes, but not in the probe trials, you'll That's notice, true. just in the training trials, so I right. don't know, he might have mm. gotten mixed up on something. It was just a one data point for the follow-up one probe. Off. Mm-hmm. But overall, responding maintained at the one-month follow-up, which was really nice to see. Now, before we get into sort of some discussion and summary, I just wanted to let folks at home know, if you are listening to us and would like to apply for continuing education credit, you can do so. There's a link on the page, and you'll just need to know the episode and the secret code words. We'll have two secret code words this week. The first secret code word is WIC, W-I-C-K, like in a candle, Or in that really cool Keanu Reeves movie where he goes around shooting everybody. You guys see that? No. No. I know you didn't see that, Diana, because the two times I watched it, you were not there. (laughs) She was at my house. Oh, John Wick? John Wick, yes. Oh, Oh, yeah. I did not see that. It's very good. I don't usually watch Keanu Reeves. Keanu. It's it's a movie in which it's... Is there a lot of gun violence? Where is your range, Keanu? It's from here to here, and that's the only place we're going to put this character. So it works very, very well. Oh, I get it now. I was like, I'm not sure what you're talking about with range. So Keanu, it's Shakespeare. We need you up here. No, no, don't do that. 
Wait, was he? He's that? actually classically trained as a Shakespearean actor. He was in a Shakespearean movie. I forget which one it was, but what you do about Love? nothing, baby? I'm just kidding. Ha <laughs> 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 ha! That's the kind of movie I watch. I like that. That's What's cool. that movie that he played with Sandra Bullock in it? And Speed. Were... Bill and Ted. No, it's Speed. It was Speed. <laughs> it was Speed, but there was Speed another two one too, in a boat. I think. He's not in Speed Two. <laughs> I think it's Jason Patrick. I think, Come on. but I think there was another one when they were like on. He was going. Oh, to the his glass wedding. house. No, he was going to his <gasps> wedding. The lake house. The lake house? The lake house is so good. I really was he in that? that? Yes, he was I in like that. The lake and house. Sandra Bullock. I like yeah. it. It's good. Rob likes it. I do. Oh, that was like a crier. I do. Yeah, he cried. I don't. I didn't. No. Oh. Time it, travel. It ain't no Toy Story three. Or time, um. time. That's like time travel. Time travel. It was good actually. It was good. It was really good. Like it. Everyone should watch the Lake House. It's in the, like nineties. Yeah. yeah. But in any Late case, 90s. your secret code word is not Lake House or Shakespeare. Mm. It's, it's Wick. It's Wick. W I C K. Got it. Like. <laughs> My last name, if I married someone with the last name Wick. Mm, true. <laughs> yep. That's a really that's, good point. That's, there you go. That's what it is. Cool. That was the and longest. like those, like, yeah. you know, special shirts you wear when you run. You're like, they wick away moisture. Oh, that's true. All right, well, that was the longest tangent secret code word we've ever had. So congratulations, <laughs> everyone. Back, we can top it. Back to the discussion. Okay. So, again, the results of the study were pretty straightforward. I think that... They did a lot of really nice work to build in opportunities to ensure generalization, and they got the results that they were looking for, which is awesome. They weren't just teaching one particular skill. They were working to teach this behavioral cusp of being able to ask, go to someone and ask for help and identify what the problem was. What we don't have in this study, which of course we would love to have, are some additional generalization points to actual vocational tasks mm-hmm. that were different from what was learned here. Mm-hmm. One thing I love is that they use 12 and 13 year olds. Mm-hmm. I think that's awesome because mm-hmm. in most settings, educational settings, you don't necessarily start vocational stuff until you're 14 when yeah. you're legally required to start vocational type skills. So when I saw that, I like circled it and I wrote, yeah, yeah! with a couple exclamation points because I think it's really important when you get close to that age, like why not start doing pre voc skills? Why not start teaching some responses that are going to help? Well, I don't, I don't want to get too much into it now. We could probably bring it back up in dissemination station. But sure. you don't put transitioning into the IEPs and in, no. just plans, at least in Massachusetts, till 14. Right. So 12 and 13, I think there's a there's still that push of how are you going to meet all your curricular needs? You know, you, you sure. got to learn about geology. I mean, it's not, I don't remember that's a strand at that age. But, but this one could be functional communication. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is the key here, my friends. You're teaching yeah. a functional communication response here, not necessarily a vocational task, but the two can be related. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So IEPs, here we come. Yeah. But you could practice this with art materials or getting lunch lunches ready at the for your classroom. Or, or just eating lunch, which I said before about the spoon, just yeah. not having the spoon there and hoping that your kid doesn't like eating with their hands. Yeah. there's This can yeah. be practiced in many different contexts, not just vocational work. Another limitation that they mentioned here was that the individuals did not vary their language from the scripts that they had learned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't know that much about these participants, and it may be that they were just more script dependent. Mm -hmm. They didn't vary the scripts as they were being taught, which was one way that they maybe could have worked against that type of memorization. Right. But But overall, I feel like it's relatively minor. Right. And to be honest, like, if you're going to ask for help, you don't really need a lot of ways to ask for help. No, like, just right. I need help is pretty good. And yes, it's like being specific. You could vary it up. I mean, obviously, you don't want to make rote responding mm-hmm. in any type of like a part of as part of any type of repertoire. But in this instance, if that's what happens, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, and they weren't just saying I need help. They had yeah, to they also saying, then like, describe yeah. it. So it was right. like they would say, um, like the paper clips are missing. Can you get me more paper clips? Mm-hmm. So right. it was a pretty long response. As is, it just was sort of in the same format. Yeah, and specific. Time. And I think specific is key because if you have someone come up to you and just say, I need help, your next question is going to be, what do you need help with? Yeah. And if... I need help. Yeah, if, yeah. if it's not clear what it is or that, that piece hasn't been trained or it's not just coming out spontaneously, it just it just seems very... What are you going to do? You know, supervisor can't help you if they don't know what's probably They got to right. go yeah. over, see what's going on, try to figure it out. And again, those are just ways that you, you as the individual, 
are not being independent. You are counting mm-hmm. on someone to mm-hmm. come help you and Sherlock Holmes out what the problem is. And that's not and that's not living independently. That's not right. that's not really holding a job. I mean, how many times is the supervisor going to come spend 10 minutes? All right. Uh, it looks like this is here. That's oh, it looks like this before you're not employable it's the like, same way you right. would be. Every time I go to IT, <laughs> I need help. Yeah. What's the problem? I need help. <laughs> computer. I don't computer. know. Yeah. My computer is broken. Yeah. I need help. That's funny. <laughs> I did actually witness this yesterday. I went on a Starbucks binge, so I haven't had Starbucks in a long time. I bought my drink, so I try tea latte. Uh, Excellent I, choice. Thank you. I got a tall. Hmm. And they forgot it for some reason. It just got put aside far away from the drink machine uh-huh. so i sat there for like 15 minutes just waiting for my drink but i didn't want to ask because i was actually very interested in watching the employee interactions mm-hmm. so one of the employees was obviously someone on with some sort of intellectual disability uh-huh. and his supervisor was being amazing but i could imagine that all day long that would be very taxing so she would say now do this and then she'd have to give him like a list of how to do it like mm-hmm. I'm oh, okay, now you yeah. have to empty the trash can. So this is how you empty the trash can. So she would give him like a verbal list of mm. what to do. Then he would do that. And when he was done, he would just stand there. Oh, yeah. And smile and yeah. wait yeah. for her to come back over. And then she'd be like, now make this drink. You're going to do this, this, this and this. And then he would do it. But then he was done. He would just stand there oh. and wait. Mm-hmm. So I think something like this may really be helpful for him because... He just had no initiative whatsoever. Like, he was could complete all the tasks. Mm-hmm. He could do them independently mm-hmm. with that prior prompt, but never went to another task. And I watched this for 15 minutes, and I wanted to, oh. like, high-five her because she was being so amazing. But I could tell that she was just... And it was really busy. Because she's probably mm-hmm. doing having her own whole list of things right. she's trying yeah. to do, yeah. too. But how easy... Well, I don't know if it would be easy, but how beneficial would it be to just teach him okay when you're done with a task go find your supervisor and say what next right yeah right? and so then she wouldn't have to come find him or maybe he could have a whole little like three ring right of mm-hmm. tas of different things that he could do mm-hmm. so he'd say what next and she'd say make a drink and then he would have it right there and that, right. would, that would be the only thing that she had to do right mm-hmm. But it was just interesting to watch, and I was like, kudos to the supervisor at Starbucks for being mm-hmm. like so patient and so amazing, mm-hmm. but we should work on making him more yeah. independent. And he's learned so much. He's got he's a lot so of much. really he's great, great. Yeah. barista skills, but which I, is good. I think it speaks to the same, you know, the topics we talked about last week, in that it's not necessarily that, well, the problem is people with disabilities, they just can't do the job. Right. They can do the yeah. jobs. They can complete the skills. It's the small pieces of kind of connective tissue right. of if you're stuck you can ask for help specifically right. if mm-hmm. you're done with a task move on to the, next, the next task right. because again if someone's not great at their job and they're kind of like lazy or they do it sort of poorly you you kind of oh god come on you got to do it again but when they're good at their job but it feels like you have to constantly be watching them and supervising them so that they continue on i, I think it gets very hard very fast and it right. becomes to, to the point that they may may not be employable, even though they're perfectly capable right. of the tasks. What happened with your drink? I got it eventually. Some she know the supervisor noticed oh. that I was sitting there, and she goes, "Can I help you?" I'm like, "I'm just waiting for my drink." She's like, "You've been waiting a long time," and I was mm-hmm. like, "That's okay. <laughs> I think it might be over there by the sink." So I think like the lady like held the glass Put and then the just place. did something else, mm-hmm. and yeah. she's like, "Oh, there it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> cool." I didn't want to go to work anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> it was good to just do nothing for one minute. We're heading into fall. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. I don't change my drink habits, though. Not even with the change of seasons? Nope. Oh, well. I'm always a hot drinker. Oh, me too. Yeah, I don't like ice. Anyway, we're, we're, we're too much coffee talk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> coffee talk. <laughs> All right. I feel like the last time we had a, an article where we discussed script fading, both of you were sort of down on, on the use of script fading. Not, not that you disliked it, but had some concerns about its utility in certain aspects. Is that... With vocational tasks, I actually don't have a problem. With some other tasks, yeah, I, I don't think it's like with specifically with um, interaction and communication skills. If you're just teaching one script and not teaching a m- multiple scripts, then you do get that rote responding, which is awkward when you're trying to have a conversation with someone in a more natural setting. In this instance, I think it's a great idea because these are the things you have to say, and you don't necessarily have to say anything else. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to be chit chatting. How's your day? 
oh, mine was great. Oh, what do I have to do next? Like, <laughs> I'm out of paper clips. <laughs> right. So I think in this situation, I think script painting is actually a, is a really good idea. Mm-hmm. I got no problem with it. Yeah. Okay. I like the recommendation to do multiple scripts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think that would be awesome. I mean, their study was awesome already, but to even make it more awesome, this would be a good replication to do everything that they did and then add multiple scripts to it. Mm-hmm. Great master's thesis for anyone out there that's like, what should I do my master's on? This. There you go. Do it. Ding, ding, ding. That's what we're here for. It would be cool if they did like a completely novel problem. Mm -hmm. Although I Mm -hmm. don't think they would see generalization, but maybe they would. That would be just interesting to see. Mm -hmm. It would be. I I think it would depend on the individuals. Right. And depend on what class, you know, what response class they're looking at. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, play it out. What are the problems that one usually faces at work? You're out of something something is not working or you don't know what to do I mean, i'm sure there are other ones too but you could lay out like what are the general problems right well like, go, go to a go to the company that the individual is interested in working for mm-hmm. to the field that they're interested in and ask you know do a quick survey of like 20 people that they'll be working with like what what are the problems you run into in a day and then you could potentially train around those right those problems even if it doesn't generalize on its own at least you know you're picking the real situation so these are 12 and 13 year olds they don't have a job site Right. But, but they will. They will. And knowing ahead of time what you might need to teach them to ask about is going to save a lot of time. I, I'd love to see if they could generalize it. But again, I think even with a skill like when we did picture activity schedules, right. if that doesn't generalize, and it is the exact same skill with different pictures in a different yeah, setting, that's true. I can't imagine something this complex just magically works when, right. when you have something totally new. But maybe. You never know. You never. Yeah, you really never know. I mean, if you're teaching a response as a class Mm -hmm. like you're saying then it's definitely possible that you could see generalization within that class Mm -hmm. probably not across the class but within it definitely like what if now you went to lunch and had missing utensils would you see generalization to that Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe that's too different but Mm -hmm. that would be interesting to look at too Mm -hmm. yeah maybe maybe something something to explore and i think the crux of all the research on vocational and adult services is nobody really knows Mm -hmm. it's wide open Sure is. All right. Well, thank you so much for going into that into that article. Sure. This is a really nicely done article, so I was excited to review it. Yeah. I always love when they have the multiple ways that, you know, that we've got our like couple conditions and we have to wrap them around each other. Mm-hmm. Though I, I then would not be able to run that because I, tra- <laughs> I can't keep track of that matrix of, of conditions myself. I love that this was a master's thesis. Yeah. So I love it when I look and I, I always look at the acknowledgments yeah. to mm-hmm. see like, why did you do it? Did you have money to do it? Did you have to do it? But this is an excellent master's thesis. Mm-hmm. I want to high five this it's person. Nice. It's, a pro- it's a real problem. And yeah. Thought of creatively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was good. Is that a Caldwell College? Good job, Caldwell, right. New Jersey. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's move on to an evaluation of two instruction methods to increase employment options for young adults with autism spectrum disorders, which... I'll be honest, I think includes parts of a procedure I never imagined I would see in a research article. Right. So I I do, I was very surprised, like I'm even speechless right now, just trying to like start to talk about this. You had some logistics questions that I think we'll have to, did. We'll have to get did, yeah. Through. I have some logistics questions because I have not engaged in this sort of vocational activity before. So I'm going to make this discussion more collaborative in nature because it's so hilarious i think it's valid and a great job for people that want this type of job Uh, i just can't ever imagine doing this job so i'll just tell you what it is it is being a person that wears an inflatable mascot costume there you go (laughs) a firefighter walk around mascot costume it's inflatable that's the best did you look him up did you look up the walk around he's amazing I couldn't find him. I couldn't find Firefighter Sam. Or what was he called? Fireman Sam? Fireman Sam. Mm. I found a bunch of other examples. Yeah. So you put this costume on, and then they blow it up around (laughs) you, (laughs) which is amazing. At first I was like, how are they going to get in this? really claustrophobic. Yeah. But I guess it's big because you can tape an iPhone to the inside of it Mm. and still be able to see. Yeah. So you can look these up. Look what up? All of the walk around costumes. Oh, I didn't look up all of them. No, but that's I did. Like I good. went to the website. They'll make you a custom one. I, I saw a T Rex. I was at I was at the we, we had a local uh, comic convention. Uh, I took my took the kids to, 
and yeah, there the was kids. A, yeah the kids one they they were like I need to spend three hundred dollars <laughs> on comic books and I was like oh you kids and your comics but there was someone with a giant inflatable T Rex and I I could tell it was inflatable oh. because it had a little fan on the on the side of it. It seems up. like so hot yeah. to wear these oh, things. Yeah, and it was very hot that day. So anyone who was in a big furry costume was just walking around with big furry pants on and, and a head yeah. or something. But these are not furry. These are no, these in, are the inflatable like, balloon ones. type yeah. on the outside. But yeah, so I went to their website and I wrote down what my favorite ones oh, were. Oh, tell me. The first one was Rocket Robot. He was like a rocket and a robot mm-hmm. cool. combined. The next one was the Miami Heat mascot. mascot. Wow. Mm-hmm. Which is like... Wait, the Miami, the basketball player or the movie? Huh? I think the That's bas- Miami Vice you're oh. thinking of. <laughs> Just kidding. Was, yeah, the basketball okay. team. So he looks like a, like a thing from, like the honker from Sesame Street. Oh, yeah, okay. He's like fuzzy and orange, but he has a green basketball nose. Oh, smart. Yeah, it was weird. Okay. And then there was Peter Pan peanut butter, like a giant jar. I love a giant that. giant inflatable jar oh. of peanut butter. Okay. okay. But my favorite one, guys, of all... The one you bought. The one I bought, the one that's coming <laughs> soon, was called Barack Olama. Was- what? Was it the llama Barack Obama? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It was a llama. It was like a presidential llama. Yeah. Okay. My friend actually had an entire party based around this llama. I never heard of this idea. Oh, yeah. It's It's, it's a real idea? Mm-hmm. It's it just popular. People as, it's just real figures as llamas, or is it specifically just the president? It's the president. Okay. Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah, Barack okay. Obama. Okay. Because they're on the llama. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's super clever. But anyway, so, so... Yeah, check it out, guys. Here's the vocational skill to interact in this training program as the fire, inflatable firefighter in yeah. the costume. And so they wanted to look at two types of vocational training programs. Behavioral skills training, which we all know that consists of instruction, modeling, mm-hmm. role play, feedback. Mm-hmm. And also a, what they call a performance cue system. So this is an iPhone application. Um, and what it did, does, or did, I'm having a hard time. It depends on if it's still on the app store, whether or not it's does or did. You're right. And it is still there. So it is a does. Did you look what? it up on the app store? Yeah, it's there. What it, oh, really? Yeah. Is um, that what pro- proprietary means? That means that you can buy it. Oh. I didn't even I thought think it, to it, look it was like up. they made it, it themselves. Was... I don't well, know they why. did. They probably confused. did. They might have made it themselves, but then you can just put whatever you want on the app store. But I just assumed it was oh, I, it's in a, this so, study, and then it it's in the a, wind. It's just a list. I think it just tells you what you're going to do, and you can move through the list. At, but they were as they described they it, customized right. it. Like yeah, it, it you could change. Right. Okay. And I think they queued it to the, yeah. Yeah. the person off to the side. Someone can, off to the side. Right. So what happened was the iPhone was inside the costume, taped to the costume, and it would give written cues to the participant on what they should do next. Yeah. So they wanted to see which was better. And they did Couldn't two... they just text them? Because the text would all stay there. True, true, true. So okay. they need to have something that's going to go, disappear. They want to be simple. Mm. Go, disappear. Okay. Because you can't touch it. Because yeah. it's inside your in your hands. Yeah. Are in a giant inflatable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're Mitch. stuck. Yeah. They're in... Yeah. So they did two studies, and they had six participants... With an autism spectrum disorder. I think it's pretty neat. Although I never imagined myself talking about an article teaching anyone to engage in this type of study or vocational program. No. You don't really think of that as a job, but it is somebody's Mm -hmm. job. Right. And And it's an important job. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because no one wants to just see someone dryly talking about fire safety. True. You want to see the mascot do the fun exciting things and pull people from the audience and right. like, do jokes mm-hmm. yeah all the participants were 20 years old so they wow all six all six i think huh. so young no adults. danny was 27 yeah so he was old or not really old. Well, he I was mean. an adult he, they're all adults mm-hmm. yeah so this is their actual job this wasn't a fake yeah this wasn't a fake vocational setting this is a real vocational setting so they had the costume they also had a training dvd that the employer used so there was six participants they ranged in age from 20 years old to 27 years old so they were adults and this was their actual job not necessarily a fake job like we talked about before but Mm -hmm. this was something that they could make money doing they had their costume they bought it it 
I love it. It said it could accommodate individuals ranging in height from 5 to 6.5 feet tall. I just love that. It's pretty much almost everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And they had to wear, I like this, participants were required to strap on a belt which supported a battery pack and mechanical blower that weighed 14 pounds. Wow. So you're sweating. Not only are you hot, but you have something that's 14 pounds hanging on off of you. Yeah. And so then you engage the blower. The blower inflates your entire costume, and then you're good to go. And you can move the head and arms, which I think is amazing, but you're not supposed to say anything, I don't think. No. No, They didn't have them say anything. Right. Yeah. So they had... the illusion of Fireman Sam. (laughs) Fireman Sam shouldn't say anything. He just... Moves his arms and, and head and can say yes or no with a with a shake. It's all pantomime. Yeah. So and they he had... can wiggle his mustache. They noted that. <laughs> yes, that is true. He can wiggle his mustache. That's a good one. That's important, too. Without that, kids won't learn. <laughs> so they had that training DVD that was actually created by the employer that they used to train fire personnel, but... What they figured out was that the DVD wasn't effective at teaching these specific skills, which yeah. we noticed mm-hmm. and everyone would kind of agree with. And they also had a script. So the participants were given a training script that included a detailed text narrative, one, something that the presenter was doing, and a description of the task that the mascot was doing. So the mascot's not alone um, yeah. out there training kids on you know, fire safety, there's also a presenter, so you have to interact somewhat with the presenter and follow the cues of the presenter and what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And it said there was like 63 different text cues. Yeah, so one cue per task. So 63 tasks, and the cue system has 63 text cues. Yeah. Yeah, But it's not the same every time. No. Right? So there's it's a conditional discrimination based on what the presenter is doing. So it's pretty complex. Mm Mm-hmm. So these cues, the performance cue system, again, was displayed on an iPod screen mounted with Velcro at eye level inside the mascot, and it was programmed so that the assistant offstage could touch a text cue on the iPhone, which would then display. So that was one type of vocational training program they wanted to see would be effective to teach these skills. They also gave the participants the opportunity to practice these skills at home and to document what they did and for how long they did on these home practice logs in study one. Mm-hmm. And they also did some behavioral skills training. Yeah. In study two. In both. In both. But it didn't yes. seem terribly well controlled what exactly they did for the behavioral right. skills mm. training. Right. They said they provided participants for the behavioral skills training. They had the training script. They had the training DVD, which consists, that was the modeling example. Mm-hmm. And then they could review the script and watch the video as as many times as they wanted to at home. And then they had 48 hours to practice at home. And then they went back in uh, and practiced live person with someone. Yeah. But what they were doing at home, we don't really know. No. They logged it. They logged it, but it wasn't. Yeah, Yeah. you didn't have to do anything. And then they practiced and were given feedback. That's really, they didn't let us know what the behavioral skills training criteria was yeah. for mastery or how long it took anyone, although in the graph it, it took an unnormally long period yeah. of time. Yeah. Um, but they don't specifically say that here. But yeah. And then if that wasn't working, that's when they did the performance cue system. For mm-hmm. study one. For study one. Yeah. Then they did some follow-up observations one month after treatment to see how everything was going. And one thing to note is that Although as a real job, they used a mock assembly. So it, the audience didn't consist of real children. Fake children, I'm just kidding. Real children, but it was <laughs> other experimenters and family members mm-hmm. that participated in the fire skills training. And they were well trained by the end. Right. They, <laughs> they knew <laughs> what happened, what to do if there was a fire. And two of the participants actually did perform a fire at a fire safety assembly in front of an audience. So usually we're like, oh, I wish they would do it in yeah. front of an audience. Mm-hmm. Two actually did. That's good. I think that's pretty awesome. And that's the first... Pretty, that is really awesome. Yeah. I was like nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, they really did it. How are they I hope do? they did well. <laughs> yeah. And then they did satisfaction surveys at the end. So let's look at the graph. So what we found with the graph, it's a multiple baseline across participants and the participants that, that are in figure one are Zane, Gary, and Danny. So in baseline, they're looking at percentage of scripted behaviors performed correctly. And we see very low levels of responding. 
for all three participants during baseline. And then we have the introduction of behavioral skills training. And then after five sessions for Zane, he's, you know, averaging around 60% correct. We see much lower responses for Gary. He's averaging around 30% correct. And he only did two sessions of behavioral skills training. Mm -hmm. And then the most behavioral skills training sessions were, that were done were with Danny. And so he did six and he was around 80%. Yeah. So with Danny, they didn't actually do the PCS or the performance cue system because he was demonstrating that he could engage in most of the skills required mm -hmm. for his job. But for the other two, for Gary and Zane, they implemented the PCS or the performance queuing system. And Zane saw an immediate increase to high levels and low variability with around 100% responding. And for Gary, we see an increased level, but it's, it's almost at 80% across three sessions. They revert back to behavioral skills training, but then they, they see a revert back to low levels, around 40%. And then they show that once... PCS is implemented again. They see high levels of responding, and then you see that maintained and basically generalize across that that school assembly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Gary and Danny were the ones who did right. the actual assembly. And Which they is both interesting. Did well. Because Zane did so well. I wonder why. He probably just didn't have the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Zane. They did great when they actually had to do their job. Mm hmm. So that's nice. But, I mean, the behavioral skills training, it took a long time for Danny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a sense, when everyone else with the performance queuing system, they were they quickly learned what they needed to do. Yeah. I mean, you, you would think that Danny would have probably done 100% right off the bat with right. the PCS in place, which yeah. is not surprising as it is technology telling you exactly what to do and when. Right. I think that... What we want to definitely mention, and maybe you're going to do this after we talk about study two, Jackie, is that the the queuing system had to be operated by a person, mm -hmm. right? So it required a whole other person, a whole other body there devoted specifically to giving these cues at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that's really big dependency. It is. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're hiring a whole other person. Well, yeah. I think before, I, I don't remember saying this in the article, so perhaps it was, but that posits that it's a two-man operation. You've got the, yep. the fireman or, or whoever's doing the presentation, and you've got Fireman Sam, the mascot. Th there's nothing saying that perhaps it isn't a three-man team. You've got a director. You've got an assistant who's there to, to, to lug the machinery or is there in case the costume breaks, a mm -hmm. tech person. So there may actually be a third person at every assembly, in which case it really doesn't matter. But you're, okay. you're, right, you're right, Diana. If it is a two-person job, you've now made it a three-person job for the purpose of... It's it's a great purpose, but again, it, it's turning a two-person operation into a three-person operation just to have this employment be feasible. But that in itself kind yeah. of makes it less feasible. Yeah, exactly. So but, I think we should be proud of Danny. He right. got it with... Even if it took him a few more sessions, he got it with behavioral skills mm -hmm. training and he maintained it, mm -hmm. which means he was making... These conditional discriminations on his own of when to do all these different right tasks. One thing I find interesting too, and I like uh, like this study for this reason, is that it's very rare in the literature to find data that suggests that behavioral skills training is not effective. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, there's so many articles out there like, "Oh, what are you gonna do? Behavioral skills training? Yeah. Like that's your end all gold standard for training." And I I still think it is, but it's interesting to see it might not work for everyone at all times. And I'm wondering if it may have worked for Gary. They only gave him two sessions. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not that's not really a ton to, yeah. to practice. So maybe, you know, to give behavioral skills training a little bit more of a shot, I would have given a yeah. little bit more. I'm not sure but, if they were comparing it to the average employee of this company would learn it with two days practice at home and two feedback sessions. Right. You know, was there a criteria they no. were looking for? And they didn't, they didn't lay one out. It was just... The right. mastery criteria for right. behavioral skills training. And I think what happened was that he wasn't making any progress across those two sessions, whereas with Zane and with Danny, they did see at least yeah. somewhat of an increase yeah. in responding after that second session. Mm -hmm. And with Gary, you don't. So I'm wondering if they were like, oh, let's try something else. And PCS was it was effective immediately. Sure. And then there's the, the, there was a second study as There well. was. Yeah, they used three different participants. Bruce, Terrence... And Rusty. 
They were all adults as well, with a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder or Asperger's. They range in age from 18 to 20. And what they wanted to look like, look at is if they could just use the performance acuing system alone. So not yeah. doing behavioral skills training. Mm-hmm. So they did the baseline. They were allowed to become comfortable in the, the costume. They were taught 17 basic moves, such as give me a high five, shake your hand. Wiggle um, the mustache. Yeah, wiggle the mustache. <laughs> and then they engaged in the performance cue system. And if they didn't meet criteria with the performance cue system, then they were given behavioral skills training. So they did get behavioral skills training mm-hmm. if the PCS was not was ineffective. But for all of the participants, except for Rusty. Oh, Rusty. So for Bruce and Terrence, I love that name, Terrence. For Bruce and Terrence, you did see great responding when PCS was in place and lower responding during baseline. But for Rusty... Behavioral skills training needed to be yeah. put in place with performance cueing system yeah. in order for it to so be that effective. Made me wonder what was the piece of the behavioral skills training that, that was in, that helpful? was effective. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if it was the video model. Maybe mm-hmm. just to be able to see what all the different movements look like. Right. Mm-hmm. Something. Yeah. So it's interesting. And so know. for for in this study, they had Terrence and Rusty did maintenance and generalization, and then saw pretty high responding as well. So. They were able to mm-hmm. engage in these skills in the mock assembly and as in a real assembly in that generalization probe, which is cool. Yeah. And the parents liked it. They thought it was a valuable experience. They would recommend it to others. Parents of Rusty's wrote, thanks. Well, parents of Terrence wrote, we have appreciated all of the opportunities in the various mascot performance that the study provided. So that's pretty cool. And they also said, ooh, Terrence and Rusty also said they liked the program. Good. So yeah. I was hoping that they also asked them and not just their they parents. They did. Yep. All they right, asked kids, both. you're getting in a big costume. Here we go. Have yeah. fun. Got to finish this study. So yeah. So it's really we it's, own this fireman Sam mascot costume. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it's an interesting concept. Like I'm going to teach you to wear a, a mascot costume. It's not something I would have thought I would read about in no. an article. Well, and, and I like that they did mention in the discussion the idea of we picked a job that when you think of adults with autism, you think. Probably not a job in which you are performing or you have to interact with other people because that's typically a very difficult skill. And they chose something that they had to interact and they had to be out in front of people. And, you know, they kind of pat themselves on the back, but I think rightly so. They they picked a job that, for whatever reason, I don't know if the students were interested in this. They just fell into this mascot. They're like, we own this mascot costume, guys. Where do we get this? What are we going to do? But they, with they it. looked at a job that I don't, I mean, I, I think, like you said, I don't think we think of for an adult with autism spectrum disorder. We'd be like, I don't know. That sounds scary. They might not like the costume. They're going to be in front of so yeah. many people. Is that That's a loud really fan? hard. We should work on something. Yeah, it's very loud. It's going to be hot in there. It's mm-hmm. too many. Yeah, we, we probably wouldn't look at it. But hey, they did. And, and they all well, liked it. As far they as all we liked know. it and they did well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, it's nice to see that, you know, the combination of BST. And the performance cueing system was effective, at least for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, they didn't make any efforts to fade nope. the PCS. No. Nope. No. Which I think would have been a really nice extension to mm-hmm. do here. Because it could have been that, you know, once they've had had experience mm-hmm. with getting those cues, but also hearing the actual SDs from the presenter, that they may have been able right. to make some of those discriminations on their own. Mm-hmm. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one thing that they really want to point out too is that using the performance queuing system cut down on training times which in a lot of places in like the middle of the united states you may not have job coaches you may not have yeah the availability of like even like eight sessions which isn't a lot but is a lot Mm -hmm. um so that was helpful maybe like a little combination like one session of behavioral skills training and then using that performance queuing system to cut down on time that someone else has to be there Mm -hmm. so that's kind of nice Mm -hmm. And depending on the job, you could probably use a system like this with a task that is a little more automated. So you're not counting on another person's queue to have the assistant send you the signal to go to the next queue for yourself and what action you're supposed to do. There might be jobs. It's just here are the things that happen and there's a time component. I mean, I know um, my brother actually did. He did mall shows back when he was a uh, teenager. Was he a model? 
No, was no. He a car he, model? He wore well there was one where he was like the little kid <laughs> and there were these little dinosaurs and he did a little show with the dinosaurs. And then there was another one where he was a dog. I think it was a PBS kids show with some, it wasn't what? Clifford. What? Yeah, and he was he was a dog. He was in one How of those dog costumes. How do I not know costumes. this? He doesn't really talk about it too much. Oh, uh, I am bringing this up at the next <laughs> There's a picture Perry of him Cruz somewhere. Party. <laughs> But he had he had a costume on, but the whole thing was scripted, so it wasn't a matter of okay when this person says their line, do, right. it was you are waiting a certain amount of time, and then start nodding your head like your character is talking because you're just following a recording. So there would be situations where, if if they just absolutely loved being a mascot, I mean think about those Disney World shows. You just go and you just need to pay attention to when you hear Donald say this, goofy, start waving your hands like a crazy person because you're saying mm-hmm. something. It doesn't right. even matter what you're saying. You just have to know yeah. Yeah. to react. Or if you're in a parade, there's no script. Right. You just wave mm-hmm. and you do tricks. And you and walk. You... Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know. I don't know if you guys have seen this show on Hulu. This is an aside. It's called Behind the Mask. I have mm-hmm. not. I don't have Hulu. Oh, well... On my Hulu, it thinks that I want to watch the show real bad, so every time I fall asleep watching it, this comes on, and I wake up, and then I end up watching episodes. Um, <laughs> wow. But from season one, there, so it follows four different mascots and their experiences. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Who, who knew that that would be something that you'd want to know about, but it's totally interesting. But I'm bringing it up because there's there they sort of follow like all different levels of mascot. So there's a high school mascot, and then there's like a professional mascot, and all levels in between. Mm-hmm. But the high school mascot from the first season is a boy in high school who doesn't really have a lot of friends, but he's really really popular when he is the mascot. Mm-hmm. That's nice. I yeah. know. And the mascot is called Rudy the Cedar Tree because his school mascot is the their team is the Cedars. So he's Rudy. And it goes through, like, him out of the costume trying to, like, interact with friends. And he has a really hard time. And then when he has the costume on, like, everyone is running up to him and, like, giving him high fives and things like that. So thinking – I don't think that he has a diagnosis or anything like that. But thinking about that situation, maybe this is something that would be really helpful for an individual with autism who maybe wants to make friends but has a hard time. Maybe this is, like, a good means of of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's important, though, that – to note that this is probably not going to be full-time employment for most people Mm -hmm. so yeah those of you listening should not run out and buy firefighter sam the prices are not listed on the website which is not a good sign. that's never a good sign for something that inflates itself and has its own (laughs) battery pack i'm assuming it's it's 14 pounds expensive yeah right but i think it's important because if you do have this even as a part-time gig you're still learning what it takes to have a job so Mm -hmm. following directions showing up on time being part of a work yeah once you get that thing on like you have to see it through to the end right so i think no bathroom breaks yeah those are great skills to have anyway and it'll look good on your resume when you start looking for other types of employment Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. that you've actually held a job for some time so even if this it seems funny to read this like oh we're teaching kids to hang out in inflatable costumes it's actually a skill that kids need to know is Mm -hmm. Going to oh, yeah, and... there's plenty that's applicable right. here to other types of of jobs. Yeah. And I thought that the first line in the conclusion section was really worth noting, too, Jackie. It says, for many of us, our job helps define our identity. So it's unfortunate that employment in an area which presents such significant challenges for individuals with ASD. And it's true. We do really rely on our jobs and our careers to help define large parts of of who how we see ourselves so that's something that we don't want to deny other individuals and if we can find anything that they can have as employment and feel proud that they're able to do then i think that's really important yeah i like it although it was funny to read and to talk about i think it's 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 relevant and it's important yeah. But it was silly. I'm like, oh, I was reading it not knowing because I didn't. I never read the abstract first. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you just dive right in. I dive right in and then read the abstract after to see if I agree with the mm-hmm. uh, what the authors say in the abstract. So I'm like reading through, reading through. I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So here's some questions I have. You can't talk in the costume, or right. people can't hear you, right? They probably could hear you, but we'd be muffled. It would be weird and. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be good enough audio, I assume, for the children or the audience to hear you, right. and so so it wouldn't be effective. Yeah. But you can see. Yes. Kind of. Most yeah. most of the time, they have 
an area that's it, it's not quite one way, but it's just it's a little screen like that allows you to see out of, and you can see, I mean you can technically see into it, but it's not as easy to see into it as it is yeah. to see out. Like the I, Disney I characters, it's like their mouth, like Pluto and Goofy. You like can their see mouths out of their mouth. are open. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So like the black part is actually where the person can see out. You know, I've always wondered this. Mm-hmm. We used to have this very larger than life bear in my mall, and I always wondered how they knew it was me. Mm-hmm. Well, because I live in a very small town, and then every time I walked up to the bear, they'd be like, "Hello, Jackie," and I was like, oh. "And I knew somebody was in there, but I just never could figure out where, where yes. they were." That was a ghost. That was a ghost bear, Jackie. I, that thing was alive. Ooh. Yeah, it might have been alive. It was so big and beautiful. Usually, the bear. I think that we saw a bear at the at the Nutcracker once, and it had sort of in its chest. You could tell it was the little screen because it wasn't covered in fur. Maybe I just wasn't smart as a young child because well, I never knew this as a child uh, yeah. either. Well, i have still been wondering about it today, so I think I've uncovered a childhood mystery of mine. <laughs> I bet it was. I bet it was in his mouth. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'm gonna go back and look okay, at pictures. There we go. <laughs> hmm. Go check on that. Wow. But anyway, well, cool. I I think it's time. The, I think it the, is. The bear and fireman Sam are waiting on the platform <laughs> as we head on into Dissemination Station. Now I sound like the guy from the Big Country Railroad at yeah, Disney you World. Yeah, That was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there we go. I was waiting for it. We, we need a ticket to get on to Dissemination Station, and that would be the second code word of the evening. Clever. Of the show. Thank you, thank you. Which is castle. C-A-S-T-L-E. Castle. All this talk of mascots made me start thinking about the Magic Kingdom castle. And so that's the next code word. There's a, there's a rhyme and reason to these code words. If, if someone figures out the, the key, then they'll never listen to the show again. <laughs> and they'll be inside your mind. <gasps> I'm too easy to predict, I think. All right, so we have our secret code words, and let's get into Dissemination Station. Uh, can I go first? I don't yeah, usually go sure. first. But it, We're bucking the trend today. I went first. In the beginning, now you're going to go first. Just do it. The, these articles, more specifically, I think the, your article, Jackie, made me think of something that Dr. Gerhardt said in last week's episode. The idea of technology being a huge component mm. of what we're going to be able to do right. to help adults with autism in vocational settings. Right. So you've got the, the iPhone with the, the picture the picture queuing system, that's one way that, again, five years ago, six years ago, would not have been an option. It was behavioral skills training, and that, that that's about it. Virtual reality is something that you can now go to the store and purchase. So as much as there's no data on whether that will, you know, the skills you could learn in a virtual setting will generalize to a real setting, it's better than what we've done in the past, which is mock areas. Could that be an avenue of research? So... I'm really excited, I think, with so many technologies. We've got pocket computers. We've got means of transporting people to wherever we want them to sort of train in that we can do a lot more with technology to help help individuals than we've ever been mm-hmm. able to before. And, and honestly, that will just continue to increase. So it's nice to have these techniques. And I don't think we think about some of the technology that could be used as much uh, it's everything's kind of still low tech in in weird ways. But there are so many great apps out there, right? That you could use for vocational purposes, like picture schedule apps or mm-hmm. different types of scheduling apps. And I mean, everyone has their face in their phone all the time, so it's not even really socially stigmatizing to have someone be looking at their phone, even as they're working. <laughs> <laughs> True. So it seems like a really promising avenue. Mm-hmm. When we focus specifically on vocational training for this episode as far as talking about transitioning to adulthood and i i liked my article i mean not that i wrote it but my dato food fojute article because to me it was trying to look at what are the overarching skills that are going to be really helpful in transitioning individuals into adulthood and thinking about what they might need for vocational purposes and I know Dr. Gerhardt talked about some of those things last week, but to me that is really where we should be focusing our attention and not just when kids are 20 or 21 and about to transition, but starting when kids are 12, 13, and 14, Mm -hmm. thinking about what those skills are that are needed. So I thought that was a really important area of research, and I'm sure there are many others like that, just 
we talked about a few of them, like being able to move from one task to another, being able to stay engaged independently, being able to either problem solve from maybe a short list of common solutions to a problem right. or knowing when to go get someone to help you solve a problem. All of those to me seem like behavioral cusps for vocational skills. I and don't know for if you guys life, have others, mm-hmm. to be honest. Yeah. And just general life. Mm-hmm. So even if we started younger, mm-hmm. you know, like seven, eight, nine, and yeah. they're not necessarily vocational skills or life skills. Like if I'm at home and the TV doesn't work, do I throw the remote control at the TV and then break the TV? Or you stand there until you, someone comes and tells you how to fix your right. TV. Or do Bang I. Bang on the side of it. Yeah. Or do yeah. I find the manual? Or do I find my mom? Or do I, you know, yeah. like there's a lot of different ways that we can, you know, teach those problem solving skills that I think are really helpful that can then help increase vocational skills later on Mm -hmm. i totally agree a lot of these skills they're not taught as early as they need to i agree Mm -hmm. you'd think that there would be more especially as we hit these these peak numbers of children young adults becoming adults aging out of our educational systems you would think that someone would have said, "Why don't we woke, where, why don't we work on this more?" Because I think people. Well, it's do. all just happening right now, right? This is, but it's, it's so fresh. It's but it's so late, and I still feel, uh. I still feel like I, I you know, you, you talk to folks about, hey, why aren't we working on skill X or skill Y? This is a cusp. This is a skill they need. Well, but they have to get into inclusion for story time. I was like, what the, what are you doing? This is not a use, not a good use of time. I mean, there there are certainly people who can go to story time, but it's not necessarily the best use of time. And there's this, it just feels like there's still the thought of, well, we have to make sure that they're being educated. They have to be able to hit all their educational goals and make their state mandated testing. Yeah, that's Rather definitely than, working against. Why right. are we? Everyone needs to learn these. I mean, even typical students. I don't think. I mean, I think, isn't that the big issue yeah. that, that we run into? Everyone's hel- helicopter parents, helicopter parents. Nobody knows how to solve their own problems. Right. So you're ra- <laughs> you're, are we raising generations yeah. of children with disabilities who don't know how to solve their own problems, as well as their typical peers who true. also cannot solve their own problems? That is true. I agree there. I love the Facebook meme now that's going around Facebook that says, let's bring the class hashtag adulting back to high school. <laughs> To teach kids oh, how nice. to be adults. Like, oh, you talked about that last. You talked about that last yeah. episode, Jackie. All the different canoe making classes you had to take. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, even just like we talked about last night, like balancing a checkbook. Like, yeah, that's not the one I thought you were going to say. There's another oh. meme that I saw that is a uh, posted on a school door. That said, "Dear parents, if you were bringing your child's lunchbox, backpack, or homework to them because they forgot it." Turn around, take it with you, and go back home. They will learn to problem solve in other ways. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. But they could starve, Dan. If they don't have lunch that one day, I mean. They won't starve. But sweet little Timmy, he's, he's, <laughs> he needs me. <laughs> Got to follow him around. And, uh. That's the problem, though, is that we're not preparing kids for the future. Right? right. And maybe that's typically developing kids or kids on the spectrum. And, you know, everyone, we all feel that giving kids appropriate the appropriate level of services is what they need, right? So I work in early intervention. We want to get kids as much individual, one-on-one, concentrated, intensive intervention as possible. And I think that's appropriate at some point in time. But as kids age, that needs to change. That focus has to change to thinking about what is the setting that they're going to be in, what are the kind of supports that they're going to have. Mm -hmm. And if we're continuing to provide this intensive level of intervention we're not properly preparing them for being out on their own and being more independent and i think that that's something that we need to be considering the options are we can teach young adults how to be more independent or we can get a lot more money to continue that intense teaching when they're adults i'm thinking one of these (laughs) one of these is a made-up solution yeah that money is not I don't know where that money is. You just print it. You just print the money, right? Oh, yeah. You know you do it? You're right. I take it from my Monopoly game. There you go. Is it's that working stuff. for you? Um, no. <laughs> it's too bad. And I, I just keep playing McDonald's Monopoly. Oh, smart. Yeah, uh-huh. it's going to happen. And uh, tragic for your health. Yeah, I know. Well, love me. You just buy it for the pieces you're on it. And you'd like to think that even in the, in the mid-2000s when we had our banking crises and our housing crises, and all of a sudden the money dried up. Not just for adults with disabilities, but the money dried up for mm-hmm. every service. You'd like to think that everyone took a long, hard look and said, okay, how can we do everything much more efficiently and much more effectively and really target these skills? 
and they did for like a year and then oh no everything's great don't worry about it and i just see the same patterns of why don't we spend money on this thing i didn't like that thing let's spend money on a different and it's just chasing trends and chasing fads instead of just sitting down and looking at we've got we've got the technology not just not just you know tech technology we've got the ways to do these skills let's sit down and discuss what is it that is needed and maybe it's not one size fits all you know why aren't we, we got to start sure. those planning meetings way before 14 you know if this child is interested in something okay how would that be relevant to their future i mean you know a, a nine-year-old wants to do one thing doesn't mean that's actually going to end up being their job but again starting to look for what are their patterns what are they good at what would they like to do um, there's no way you're going to get some of those employment yeah. opportunities like the the entrepreneurial supported employment unless you plan for that way in advance because if someone wants mm -hmm. to be an artist and they want to make money selling art they're not going to make any money because most people who are artists don't make any money. But is that a skill that they care about that much that, okay, well, then let's work on the social aspects that you'll need to be an artist, even though we know that's not a necessarily a great career for everyone. Um, but a lot of that planning, I think, comes very late and isn't necessarily run. You know, I've seen folks who the only data they collect on their vocational tasks, they have one thing they take data on. And they don't look at that data to say, wow, what I'm doing doesn't work. I mean, I don't care what your fad system is. At least if you're looking at data, you can say at the end of that year, what a bad idea that was. And it, it should be at feels... the end of some months, not yeah. maybe at the end well, of the year. Like, it should be. At the end of the year, oh, I just ruined all of that time. <laughs> Sorry, all you 22-year-olds. I failed you. Bye. Next group will do better. Next group. It's that sort of long-term planning and thinking yeah. that it's hard to get everyone's minds wrapped around, especially if you're working in a school, because there's money. Not, not all the money you want, but there's more money than than uh, you, you might think for different tasks. With 22, that's it. It's it's done. They're always looking for funding, new funding options. There's no way they can they can keep up the pace that is going to be needed. The government, I should say. The man. The man. That's enough for me. Any other dissemination points from from you guys? Well, this is what I've been thinking about. Rob and I just recently finished watching season one of The Wire. <laughs> Ten, ten, has been ten years about this. too late. <laughs> Dana literally has been talking about this. Like, oh my god, you really need Guys, to see this show. It's have like, you heard so of this show? Good. It's called The Wire. It's really good. It was really good though. That's I the know. thing, and I just keep thinking about it. And you know, I'm not going to give away what happens in the season, but because everyone's already seen it <laughs> because it was on ten years ago. <laughs> but that's okay. But you know, one of the main themes of the show is that everyone is a product of their environment that they are living in, right. and there's individuals who are stuck in their environment and people might ask them how why can't you get out of this environment and their answer is this is what I've grown up in this is what my family has always lived in and I wouldn't know how to live in another environment and I think that there are parallels that could be drawn here too because really we have two completely different environments right now the under 22 environment and the over 22 environment and we're preparing kids really, really well to live within the under-22 environment. Right. But we're not preparing them to live in the over-22 environment. And you spend most of your life as an adult in the over-22 environment. And if we want individuals to be successful, we really need to be thinking much more carefully about how we should prepare them for that environment. Yeah. Watch I've, The Wire. I've been thinking about this, too. I had a student that I worked with a while ago who it was exclusively with a teacher always. Yeah. And any time... He needed to be with a student and a teacher, so like a ratio of one teacher to two students. Mm -hmm. He couldn't handle life because he'd never had teacher direct his attention away mm -hmm. from him. And as he got older, it got worse and worse Yeah. because by the time they started to start thinking about putting him with another student, yep. he was already like 16 years old. And so it became like a big, big problem, and he had all this problem behavior that emerged. It took years, yeah. actually, to get rid of that problem behavior where if – we may have started that a little bit sooner yeah. or younger. We might have been able to, to figure that out. Yeah. And just sad because then it took a lot of years that we could have actually been working on something. Mm -hmm. But we had to get rid of the problem behavior first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know my rule of thumb, I, I try to get folks to think very critically about independence and supports. I mean, certainly as soon as possible. But once a student's in first and second grade – if they're able to, if they're not working on group skills and not just, 
not just a few group skills, like real group learning, right. the ability to hear an instruction and follow it, even though it wasn't, Billy, do this. It's okay, class, right. go do this. There really has to be a lot of thought put into, are they, being able, are they educated in that fashion? Can they be educated in that fashion? If they're not, why not? So we can solve those problems. Because by mm-hmm. third, fourth, fifth grade, unless there's extenuating circumstances, it really needs to be part of their routine that adults are not following you around all the time anymore. There are things you have to be able to do because from now on out, that's going to be a huge focus of your school life is being able to be independent and by yourself. And I know that won't be true for every student with disabilities because yeah. there are there are students who will always need one-to-one support. But for the vast majority of them, it's sad. It, we don't even give them a chance to be independent. We need to give right. them a chance. Yeah, yeah. we don't. We talked about just two very, very specific vocational prep articles or vocational articles. We didn't touch on any of the other areas of living in the community, mm-hmm. sexuality. We didn't talk about any of that stuff. And it's it's an issue that there's not. I mean, when we're looking for research for this episode, there isn't a I couldn't ton even find any right. to try and talk about sexuality. It was It's very limited out there, mm-hmm. folks. I mean, it was the same thing that... that there's Dr. a lot Gerhardt of articles... Said. Uh, thought pieces about this is something we should be addressing. There's very little mm-hmm. out there that actually looked at measurement of behavior and, and changing behavior over time. Yeah. There's almost nothing. Well, from the, the, the article we discussed last week, uh, in 2011, and then in talking to Dr. Gerhardt, what changed was the first thing I asked. And you know, unfortunately, not very much right. in that five years. And again, I think it, it's probably more that people are doing a lot, but it's not being published or it's not considered publishable or people aren't even thinking that it might be worth looking at publishing and getting the word out. Right. And now, I mean, it's hard to get those types of studies published through an IRB. Mm-hmm. True. So Because of the, the fact that they're adults? Or? They're adults and sexuality is a topic that's a little, you know, mm-hmm. dicey sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's really important. It is super important, and you should be trying. But I'm wondering if that's one of the reasons is that it's hard to get through IRBs. There is someone in Springfield that works with pedophiles, hmm. and he has a hard time getting his research through IRBs. Makes sense. What's the issue? Is that they don't want to touch the topic. There are they don't want to touch the topic. Yeah, uh, there's a whole lot of yeah. There's a whole lot of issues. A whole slew of issues. Yeah. But I think it's really important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he has a really hard time getting any of his research ideas, mm-hmm. grant money, and mm-hmm. or through IRBs. Hmm. Well, all right. That's that. <laughs> well, thanks everyone so much for listening. I, I hope that the past two two episodes are double-sized, two episodes in a row, which we're not going to do again for a little <laughs> while because it's, it's a lot of work. We hope that this has been something to kind of get you thinking even if you're not working with adults or you're working not working with adolescents to really be thinking about it for whatever age group that you are you are supporting that these are going to be big issues and they're going to be bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on and while it is nice that i think looking at the three to five six seven eight we've done a much better job as professionals in getting kids out of our really specialized programs back into inclusion more with their typical peers that doesn't necessarily translate to successful adulthood, unfortunately. And I think a lot of the statistics from from last week's article show that. Yeah. It's not just, oh, well, they're back with their peers. Everything's going to be okay. Maybe. But it's not something that we can just... You have to be able to learn in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully you're all thinking a little bit more about this. And we certainly appreciate you listening to us talk about this because it gave us something to think about, too. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Jackie, for being here tonight. Thanks, Thanks, Rob. Rob. Thanks, everyone at home for listening. If you're interested in purchasing continuing education credits through us, you can find a link in the show notes or you can go to the webpage at ABA Inside Track. You can find us on social media as ABA Inside Track. You can email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We'll be back next week to our normal schedule, so we'll have a silly preview episode where we talk about the articles for our next topic. It's going to be a great one. They're all great ones, though, aren't they, Jackie? Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. Most of them are pretty good. I think they're all pretty darn good. (laughs) But if anyone has any suggestions or things that they'd like to hear about, send it our way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let us know. Yeah. You can put it on the Facebook page, or you can just email us directly. Do not email us with how the wire ends. I hear it's one of the best endings, and I don't want it spoiled. La, 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 la. 
don't yeah don't even i'll revoke you if you got cds from us they're revoked if you tell me the end of the wire i swear all right well everyone thanks again so much for listening we'll be back next week with another episode but until then keep responding bye, bye.